Greetings and welcome back to the Rose Bros podcast. This episode, we are joined by Rafi Tamazian, Senior Portfolio Manager and Director at Canoe Financial, a Canadian independent investment management firm with approximately $14 billion under management. Prior to Canoe, Rafi spent 13 years at First Energy Capital, a leading investment dealer that focused on the energy industry. Rafi left First Energy in 2008 as Vice Chairman and Managing Director and has held numerous public and private charity and government board positions since. Rafi currently sits on the board of directors for Aris Exploration, Well Ventures Corp, Chance Oil and Gas, and the Alberta Teachers Retirement Fund. And he also holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics from the University of Calgary. We sat down for a smooth cup of Rose Bros coffee and among other things, discuss why energy is a catalyst for life and death, record-breaking federal and provincial tax revenues, the problem with top-down governments, separating good energy investments from the best, and why today's energy industry is akin to a broken bank machine spitting out cash. Enjoy! This episode is also available on YouTube, so check out the Rose Bros channel, and if you enjoyed the conversation, subscribe to the channel. This podcast is sponsored by HeadCanadaRacing.com. Looking for high-performance ski gear this winter? In partnership with four-time Olympian Manny Arsborne Parody, HeadCanadaRacing.com is offering the lowest prices possible through its online storefront by passing brick-and-mortar savings on to the customer. Check out HeadCanadaRacing.com for more info and get your high-performance ski gear for the upcoming season. Also, this week's podcast is brought to you by Rundle Eco Services. Looking for a way to recycle your frack pond and pit liners used in the energy industry? Rundle collects and processes liners using an environmentally friendly system, leaving a clean environmental footprint. The end use of these liners are shredded and processed into pellets that can be used and extruded into various forms of usable plastic products, including furniture, various building materials, and industrial packaging. Check out rundleco.com for more details on how you can recycle your industrial pond and pit liners today. Well, we can do a rolling start then. Yeah. Thanks a lot for doing this, Rafi. My pleasure. I really appreciate your time. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to do it. I, it's good to get the story out. To start from the top, you are the Senior Portfolio Manager and Director at Canoe Financial. For anyone that is listening, what is Canoe Financial? It's a Calgary-based investment management firm. We started it with an asset, a closed-end fund in 2010 with about a billion dollars of assets. And uh, we built out a, a national sales team to round out our investment management group, bond management group, and a equity management group out of Toronto. And this energy sleeve that we created in Calgary just because of our background being energy. You fast forward today, we're at almost 14 billion in assets across the board. Energy carries about 1.4 billion of that. And uh, yeah, it's got a good start to what we hope is a, a, a long, healthy future of distributing good products, the right products to, to advisors' hands. You're also a big skier. You bet. Which is cool. Yeah, that's my, <laughs> that's my passion. Yeah. As I get older, I get more frail and I'm finding it more difficult. I'm, I'm becoming very frail is the right word. <laughs> so, um, it, plus, as you get older, your fitness wanes and skiing works, gravity is the right direction on that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I think you said you were good. Uh, well, you would have been a good slalom skier. Oh yeah, well that was because of the because I'm so old, right? Maybe the weight thing too. Yeah, I, I was disadvantaged with the weight, but no, you know, at the end of the day, I think the true passion is powder skiing. Like I'm a I I'm a I'm a powder pig. Also, quick shout out to Marty Staples for connecting us. Thanks, yeah, Marty. Yeah, cool. Yeah, great guy. I didn't know him well until I met him. On, I got to know him more. Personally, when I was on the board of Topaz until this year. So when he came on board, I got to know him much better. And that is an impressive group of people there. Very focused, committed to the direction, the purpose. And now look at that thing four years later. Clear water and, and gas in Northeast BC exposure. Like to the, the only other thing would be if you could get a royalty out of an oil sands, he'd have everything covered. <laughs> Clear water especially. Yeah, the Clearwater is just, we we were on that play early too through, uh, Spur was an excellent educator for us on that one. And we, we were we were always been followers of Clayton and his companies. And I come by that honestly, having worked with him at Renaissance back in the 80s, very lucky to work with that group of people. 
in a very simple role at the time, but for me, but followed their path and Clayton's group, they put us in front of that clear water play. We understood the economics through them and it became a major component of our growth, owning, you know, the private plays through that area in the doldrums. They've all subsequently been lapped up into, into other names. We you know we're one of the largest shareholders of Headwater. So the compelling thing there really through COVID for that play as an example was the payouts. They got the payouts happened so much quicker than having to, you know, frack a well and complete that the Monty and Duvernay do. Mm, Within months. And within now it's literally within a few months. So the economics of the play is just, we can't find anything in North America better than that. Maybe we'll get into your current energy stuff and whatnot, but for the listener, how'd you get into investing and why energy to take it back a little bit? Well, I, I was in the oil patch till the early 90s and then uh, right out of school, coincident with a massive capital cycle in the energy sector in North America in the early 90s, these boutique energy banks showed up. And it was my dad that just said to me, you know, you got to you gotta get out of this energy racket directly and go look at it from the financial side. And I wasn't really thinking about that, but some friends had started this first energy capital up and I hopped into first marathon for, to replace one of the guys that went over there. And then eventually a couple of years later, I just joined my friends there and, and the rest is history. Really. We, we were, I was 14 years during one of the, the velocity of capital entering the system and the amount of capital needed globally because Canada couldn't provide the pace of growth of capital needed. So we were institutional sales guys, basically going out to the four corners of the earth, looking for capital in, in financial centers all over the world and, and telling people Canada is the right place, the right jurisdiction and the right risk for your capital. And, you know, we went from spending a billion a year in the basin in the early 90s to by 2014, we were 85 billion a year in the basin. So there was a lot of money globally that came in here. And so that banking period, which was very lucrative for me because it clearly now looking back was the right time to do that was really my foray into it. And then the investing side, we started in 2010 when I left First Energy and it was really, we always claim like, we're not investment professionals making energy decisions, we're energy professionals making energy decisions. So we come at it a little more unorthodox than most, I think. You're kind of a man of the people too, like <laughs> stuff like this. <laughs> you always been like that? Oh, I don't know. That's a nice thing to say. My wife would say that. Everybody knows who Rafi is, sort of. Oh, that's kind. Well, <laughs> look, I was, I was born just four blocks from here, and then I live four blocks from that. So I and I grew up, you know, ten blocks down the road from there. So I've never really fifty six years. I'm kind of, this is my hometown, and yeah, I find it was never a place I had to leave. Because business-wise, it was very lucrative for me. I came, my, my family was from the patch, so it was a very natural place. My father was a geologist and practiced in the field. He was a professor at the, at the, the university and the college of geology. So it was just always something in my life. And so I find Calgary to be part of the DNA of how I think, along with Sesame Street and OPEC, I guess, really. <laughs> yeah. Fast forward to you today. We'll get into energy now. Prices are great. Everything's really good in energy in Canada and it's awesome, more or less. But back to 2020 when things weren't so good, what were you thinking then? Were you worried? Were you thinking you're going to retire? No, March 2020 was the kind of point that I guess you would call, you know, the the kick down. You know, I I went on Bloomberg that day and interviewed and they said to me, they interviewed, we went through everything. I tried to explain why prices weren't really negative in the physical market. It was a derivative market and that there was a lot of talk about, ah, this is the final piece to resistance to put the nail in the coffin in oil. It's dead finally. And anybody with any half a brain, actually even a 10th of a brain would know that there was nothing else there. And we started talking about the energy transition and there was no thing to transition into. And, and so the directive in the market was not coincident with what we were seeing and what we understand to be energy. So we felt comfortable that there'd be a 
a way out. And really, it wasn't until September 2020 where we went through the summer and we made a decision that supply was in peril. And we knew already the scope of capital required to grow it and how we were actually decreasing capital for the past five years prior to that. So the supply market, the supply system was in disarray. And the demand side, we already saw the deglobalization happening, which we thought was going to increase demand because no one was paying attention to the developed world about what was happening in the undeveloped world. And this naivety in the OECD world around the world revolves around influencers like the Kardashians. And does someone in India really care about that? They Power to us is an, an expense that goes up and down or we might have a cold shower. Power to them is life and death. And we don't appreciate that. The majority of the population of the world is in the developing world. And so we saw demand not fixed here. In fact, injured. And it's going to grow greater. So the combination of those two things made us very excited. You know, that really played out within a year from that point. By September 21, that was clearly intact. OPEC was clearly in control. In fact, it already looked like OPEC was starting to be out of control again because they didn't have the production they said. And we started to talk about energy security risk and geopolitical risk as being the issue in 21. And that even played out. So this September, we're really pitching now. The fundamentals are intact. There's no more assumptions we have to make on all those issues. The investment thesis played out perfectly since September 20. The only thing that didn't is the valuation on the sector. The sector is now oozing cash out of it and distributing it out, even structured to give it back. And the downside has been mitigated so greatly. And yet, I think the market, we believe the market is just so slow to come back to energy that they're not realizing that it's changed its stripes. It's no longer this thoroughbred growing, spending multiples of cash flow and, you know, and debt growing and decline rates increasing only to fall off a cliff. No, it's, it's actually the opposite. They've slowed down their decline rates. They're spending only 60% of their cash flow, the efficient ones that have good assets. They're consolidating the assets into fewer companies, becoming these behemoth distributors. Mm -hmm. And I still get questions when I'm on the road where people say, yeah, but what if they just start spending again? That's what the generalist investor might be afraid of. And, and I go to them in my head, I go, you don't have the right to ask me that anymore. You have to prove that now because the producers already demonstrated that they've, they've done that. They are distributors officially. They've announced it. They've built their businesses around it. They've let go a bunch of people. They have downsized into these really efficient manufacturers that are distributing money back to you and buying back their stock. And if you really, if I really have to prove myself, then let's expand capital just slightly. Well, we did that this year and service costs are up 35%. <laughs> so you can't, they can't even afford to spend anymore because there's no services available. And the service companies aren't, we know they're not spending any money to build new equipment and house them with new people because their budgets would blow up trying to figure out how to build the damn stuff and they wouldn't have anybody to run it because there's nobody to run them. So there is no such thing as just going back and spending it. And they need to, people need to realize this is going to be a process that will take several years and we'll see it coming. In the words of Nassim Taleb, I've seen gluts not followed by shortages, but I've never seen a shortage not followed by a glut. The critic would say, I'm worried that we're headed into a glut now that there's a supply crunch. What would your response be to that? Yeah, everything will ebb and flow. We think that the last time you saw a glut, if you will, it was a massive capital push from a new technology, which was the multi-frac horizontal. The... the any of them before that were huge capital expense periods, okay? From that period I mentioned when I was in the banking side, 1995 to 2008, it was a huge capital period and volumes grew. 
The last one before that was 1975 after the energy crisis and Saudi cut off oil because of the Yemenis war. The U.S. went, oh boy, we better create an SPR for emergencies. Turns out it's the emergency was a midterms. Yeah, elections. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but they, they grew. But Mexico got worried and they grew. Europe got worried and the North Sea grew. And everybody grew in the 80s, in the 70s. And we overgrew and we, we created a, a glut of supply. So, but that took 12 years. Okay. The one in the 90s took 12 years. Like it takes decades to do this, Thank not you. days and weeks. And it's just, we, you can even see that ship even when it starts to show up on the horizon from a far distance. And you just don't even see, we're not even nowhere near that right now because we have a political atmosphere out there that's very negative towards it. And the producers are going, okay, <laughs> fine. We'll just make more money than we've ever made by not showing up with supply while you keep using it. And the market doesn't understand that. That's the investment opportunity right there. The market doesn't understand how scarce it is and how conservative these companies are now because they're all distributors. And so the volatility of the sector is way lower and it's paying out way more cash. They're dividending and distributing and buying back the equivalent of 12% right now yield. And the peer group is averaging four in the S&P. So that can't stay that wide. So before that glut happens in oil, yeah. the producers are going to want to see that narrow or they're not going to spend and they can't. Mm -hmm. You kind of miss the old days of the wildcatters and the drillers and all that because now we're in the era of the capital allocators. Yeah. You know what? I don't know if I say I miss it. I, I'm just a product of the business, I guess, and I've matured with it. And in my gray hair years, I'm kind of excited to be. I'm, I'm trading into the most conservative period of investing and ri of risk of investing in my sector ever in my twilight years of my business. Like it's played out perfectly for me, really. So I think there'll be 20 or 30 percent of the production in this country that will be associated with that wildcatting and growth still. still. It'll be alive and well, but it's just going to be a much, much smaller component of our basin. There will be a vast majority of our production that will be just this distribution distribution model and be stuck there. And the volatility of that sector will lower dramatically. And so your income component of the industry, which used to traditionally be the pipes <laughs> and the infrastructure, might the better play to be might be the producers now as a distribution model and yield. The critic might just say that, and I've asked this question before to people on the podcast, that it's mature basin now and that we're in the capital allocation phase and that all the big wealth has already been found. What are your thoughts on that? I would say the wealth uh, has been found in the ground. <laughs> but now you got to get it out of the ground and, and you got to market it. And we happen to be in a point in, in North America, and this is a bit of a soapstone, you know, soapbox comment you know i think canadians need to get out of their way of themselves here right now and and realize that there's a, an incredible amount of hypocrisy going on not even hypocrisy maybe naivety and vulnerability because they're misunderstanding what's really gone on here for 40 years we recognized the north american basins needed to be mature we needed energy in north america and we had it but we were way behind in developing it so Canada and the U.S. started a program to grow aggressively through incentives that government provided to drill and, in the case of oil sands, build out facilities. And there were ways to keep spending to offset your revenue so you don't keep away from the tax man. We would d drill and have write-offs against exploration and development and create these tax pools, for instance. And you remember those flow-through funds. All of that stuff was great for Alberta. We, it meant we could flourish with jobs and grow out, and develop and exploit and create wealth for ourselves. And that turned into great wealth for the country through transfer payments, some $600 billion. So it was a successful model to build out a basin that needed maturing fast. Today, I'm saying it is fully mature and it is ready to give back 
on a biblical scale to our country. Alberta average royalties since 1990, $3.5 billion a year. This year, we're going to pay $20 billion to the government and $27 billion on strip next year. It's enormous. That's why it's so critical who is in power to manage that kind of money. Federally, income taxes, we're, the, the, companies, the companies are dividending the money out to investors who pay tax on that to the government. Okay, Canada average payout and buyback is $10 billion every year. This year is going to be $40 billion. So $30 billion more that normally goes in the ground is going to go back in people's pockets or buybacks. And that'll be taxed. And then the companies no longer have tax pools. And they're going to be taxed. So the federal government is going to make out like a bandit. And then our revenue in Alberta is growing. So that means our three-year rolling average of revenue that pays these exorbitant transfer fees is going to start to grow again. So we're going to start giving back to the rest of Canada too. So everybody needs to take a chill pill, sit back, and enjoy all of the headache and pain and suffering that you, you, you suffered through while Western Canada benefited from this great uh, run of 40 years. It's time to give it back to the rest of Canada. Don't shun it. Like, embrace it. And further to that is it, that every barrel we produce would stand up to every barrel in the world that gets produced on a human rights track record, financial stability track record, and environmental standard. Nowhere else in the world. So I think this wrong story is being spun to Canadians and, uh, and it, won't be, it, it won't be missed out on. We'll get it. It's just we could, we could have got it sooner. What we were saying earlier, natural gas prices have been low in Canada compared to, say, the U.S. or Europe. Although some producers can uh, structure themselves to protect themselves from that, yeah. in a way, we're still missing out on a large opportunity without LNG and consistently high prices. What do you think we're missing out on? What, what are we What are we giving up? Yeah, it's a... Billions of dollars? Uh, yeah, well, billions of dollars. Oh, my God, yeah, for sure. It's just a situation where we have to be good. We have to be really good at building out the facilities and infrastructure in an environmentally friendly way. That's the first and foremost. It has to happen that way. But we're not even being able to allow to try to do that. Right. And so the comments where the chancellor came from, from Germany and talked to Trudeau, and Trudeau offers him a variable energy experiment off the East Coast to spend billions, and then says, oh, no, our, our LNG is not economic. I'm sorry, Justin Trudeau telling you that it's not economic, I guarantee you he has no idea, right? That's obvious, okay? And it's not to slight him. He's the prime minister. He's not supposed to have detailed understanding. But there are powers to be in his group that want him to say that. The directive of that government is clearly they don't want this sector to flourish anymore. They don't want it to grow. They want it to end. And Canadians need to decide if that's what they want. And is it the right thing? Because their directive is all around climate change. Well, I'll just give you one quick, simple calculation. North American coal production is down substantially. And we've done a great job to attack that. And the highest coal production globally is happening today still. So why is that happening? We, we, got, we managed to get off it because the developing world needs power. And coal can do that. So we're at these huge levels of this most dirty hydrocarbon, and it's happening in the Far East. The only transition in energy that's ever happened in my lifetime was coal to gas. That's the only meaningful energy transition. Anytime someone uses the word, well, what about the energy transition? We'll ask them, well, what, what are we transitioning into? Everybody will always not answer with anything. There isn't a transition yet. So the transition was gas and gas on our West Coast delivering it to the Far East would have reduced coal usage and it would have reduced emissions and would have been good for the climate change battle. So in fact, by limiting and restricting our ability to get our cleaner fuels out, he's allowed dirtier fuels to burn and become a dirtier planet. It backfired on him. 
I think I saw today Jamie Dimon made a comment about that and he was being questioned on America's use of energy and to some effect that was his comment. Yeah, he's like, I think he would use the word stupid, I thought. <laughs> yeah, we're being stupid and we're going to need it for... <laughs> look, it's a... I, I believe... For, I was frustrated on this for a long time and I, I realized what people need to realize is let's not let's take the climate change debate out of it. Let's give that let's just say the environment we should always try to be good stewards of the environment, always being better. And what we need to realize, climate change or not, is that the world needs to live with hydrocarbons. So let's work with this climate change battle with hydrocarbons and started getting rid of them. Because the politicians now we know, we can look back now instead of looking forward and say they were, they manipulated the market. They made everybody <clears throat> worried about climate change and, and hate the conventional energy they were using through fear and guilt. And at the end of the day, they neglected to tell everybody that they should expect their costs to go higher dramatically and even make some things unaffordable. And you're going to get inconsistency around the availability of the power to you at times. You can't get elected if you tell people about the beautiful new world, if you tell them about the high costs and the variability of the power that'll show up. So that those two parts were ignored. And so we saw that, and it's just a matter of, instead of getting frustrated by it, which a lot of people will do, they'll get frustrated and go, why did that happen? Well, we look at it like, okay, well, that's happening. That's going to create a financial opportunity here. So get rich off it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that's the optimist speaking. <laughs> well, I'm an, I'm an energy investor. Yeah. A lot of people think I'm politically inclined, and I'm not. I never talked politics until 2015. Because politics started to interfere with my business. And it's an identity yeah. that we get have here in Alberta. And I was raised that way. My parents came to the country in, in the mid-60s. They were kind of like, so you work and you get rewarded. And also, you have an obligation to your community and your society and keep government away. Your job is to, if government interferes, you, you made a mistake. You didn't do it f and prevent government from having to do it. It's the reverse of kind of how this government is educating people today. And that worries me, obviously, and it creates uh, a lot of, a lack of comfort for me with, in the Federation right now, which is a, a rabbit hole we won't go down. Well, we have the Canoe Financial September 2022 energy sector update here. Maybe we'll uh, just touch on a few of the points that you are thinking about these days in the in the conclusion. Well, you know, I, I think the most important thing we want people to take away. Yeah, what are you thinking? Is the message today is <clears throat> that there's a global volatile market around us. We're all wrapped in this. Don't take the the really positive outlook for energy and disrespect the global situation around it. For the listener that is listening to this, maybe you know, what is happening globally that is causing you to be worried? Okay, yeah. I'm an economist by background. You're an expert in this, but yeah. for the layman listener. Primarily, it boils down to productivity for me. And then the next thing is liquidity of currency. So we're tightening liquidity. and Interest in the, rates are going up. And in the, in the OECD world, we have had two negative GDP quarters, and both of those periods, you had increasing inflation, uh, increasing employment in the U.S. Now, I've never really seen that, and I don't even think I remember studying a model in school where you'd have more people working less effectively. <laughs> okay? Now, the last time we were in a big period where we needed to show that our workforce was productive and growing was in the late 70s, early 80s. And Abby Joseph Cohen became famous doing what with Goldman? Telling everybody, this workforce is scary. They're hungry and they're going to go. And we don't have that this time. 
we have a we have a bunch of people clearly that want to work less and be less productive. And I'm not criticizing them. I'm saying factually that's what's happening. And so you've got this develop and you've got this all happening while the world's splitting into an undeveloped and developed world again. And that means you're going to see two different pricings for things. You don't have the luxury of building the product most effectively here and taking it there. You have to build it in two different places and one's going to be more effective than the other. And it's going to be more effective in the places where people are more productive. And that's in the developing world. So I see them having access to more commodities and energy because we produce in the developed world 30 million barrels a day and we consume 45. Oops, that's a bust. So we're going to be held ransom to them. And they don't care about us because we didn't care about them. Rewind to COP26. And we're all celebrating two shots, COVID shots, and all de- arguing and debating who gets a third shot. The developed, developing world is just outside of 5% inoculated. And at COP26, you got a bunch of people sitting up there on their high horse going to Moti and others. What are you doing about your footprint? And he's going, my footprint? Hello? I'm building infrastructure and transportation and healthcare so I can keep up with you guys because all you offered me was these variable, expensive power forms that would blow up my economy and my and people would die. And that naivety that we have just separated us that much faster. And so that's not that's making this economy in the developed world much more rickety than I like. You know, I think interest rates have to go higher and we have to get emplo- unemployment, you know, we got to get employment down and turn it around. Historically, I'm not worried about that hitting demand because demand has only been hit in recessions when you've got aggressive unemployment. 1981, 17% unemployment, 8% demand destruction. The only other recession that was more than 2% demand destruction was 2020. For sure. When we when everybody went home. Yeah, with COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no one burning anything. Right. So those two times is the only time you've got demand destruction. The rest of the recessions are very unique. And this one is also very important. We had no capital program going into it. Right. What's concerning you these days is not the demand destruction of energy, but rather the supply shortage. The supply shortage, the lack of supply available. Right. I don't want oil prices at 140. I don't want gas at 15. I because that's not that's very destructive for our economy. When oil prices were at 120, yeah. the gas <laughs> pump. You saw what was happening in the gas pump, and what did Biden do? He started pumping oil at a record pace out of the SPR, his emergency reserve. And now he's at these really low levels of his emergency reserve. So he fictitiously left the price low into his midterms so he could get the gas pump down so people won't feel as stunned for his political benefit. He created elevated geopolitical risk for the country for his political benefit. It is clear what he did. And again, that is not a political statement. It's a very powerful statement to understand yeah. that there is geopolitical risk that isn't even figured into the price of the commodities yet. That is on our doorstep. Mm-hmm. One hurricane that hits the coast and they're toast. I don't know how you're going to fight China against Taiwan when you don't have, I mean, what yeah. energy are you going to use? Energy Pixie dust and fairy tales? Like, a, you know, it's just not going to work. So that's your biggest worry. That's where we're at, September. Yeah, I just think that people should understand that energy is extremely constructive, but it is going to be overwhelmed by the global market. And so there's going to be volatility. But this industry is not built and doesn't, it's not built on its, our thesis is not built on assumptions that still have to happen. Right. But on the flip side, it's right now in a, from a financial perspective. They're here now. It's the downside is not there. There's nothing. It's black swan events. And that's it. So you're happy from the canoe financial perspective. <laughs> I Well, I, I mean, and I don't know of a single CEO in this town that I talked to that would say it otherwise. 
all of us that have all grew up together in this business, we've never seen it better ever. Well, I'm not doing, they're not working that hard. I mean, I should be careful. <laughs> they're working hard, but it's not yeah. managing people and human resources departments and, and growing employment and, and growing capital programs and procurement risk and inflation risk of costs and all that stuff. And, and managing decline rates and, and reserve reports and all that stuff. That's not happening anymore. It's now financial marketing of your, of your cash. And, you know, it's pretty, it's, it's actually trying to find a use for that cash. Acquisitions, distributions, buybacks, very traditional financial arms vehicles that would dictate that the sector is more conservative than the market is representing. And that's a huge opportunity for us. Do you worry in terms of being an energy specialist that you understand it all and you have great energy investments, but now that we're in this environment and everything's so good, it's hard to find the companies that, how do you separate the good from the better? Like, yeah, how do you pick we do that already. So there's, there, the, all ships have risen off the bottom. Yeah, exactly. And now we're sitting at the lowest level the sector's ever traded when you take it out of COVID, by the way. The group will start to separate in their valuations. The first thing that my partner Dave and I will emphasize to people is focus on the asset value and the real asset value. The value of the company is going to matter the most now because take a company that's got a, a 20% free cash flow. Well, then, you know, we hear all the time you can buy back your stock in your company in four years if you buy back, if you 20% free cash flow. What if you have a seven year reserve life? That leaves you with three years. Yep. That's a problem. So that cash flow that they're generating, they're not distributing it to you. They're not buying back their stock. They're using that cash to buy more reserves to try to get keep the train moving. Tourmaline and CNRL have 25-year reserve lives, and that's all they book. They have way more than that. They get to use all these different vehicles. to. They're not worried about having to buy an asset with their cash that cash eventually starts to sprinkle down into your hands. And the market will gravitate to that first because it's risk off there. And that's why I think the opportunity lays a lot more in those distributors today because they are going to be recognized as a place to hide and be safe. And the market will chase those yields down and the valuations higher. It seems it depends on the company right now, but there's a few really good ones pursuing growth still, maybe like Headwater with the Clearwater. On the other hand, there's companies like Tourmaline paying up massive dividends, buying back shares and all that, maybe kind of two models. Do you think it just depends on the nature of the company and their strategy? Yeah. I mean, comparing Tourmaline's situation to Headwater, the two companies is like comparing a, you know, an apple to a fish. Right. So we got to be careful there. Headwater is a company that was built in this new regime, heavily concentrated in one asset. It happened to be an asset I just touted as the best asset in North America, in my opinion. And, and so they recognize that. That's all. That wasn't luck on their part. That was a very strategic transaction that you don't even want to go into the details of what it must have been like to do that deal with Synovus. And it goes beyond even tapping the headwater guys on the shoulder and patting them. It's like Porbe and Synovus. Great job. They didn't take cash. They took back shares. They tripled the value of the transaction to themselves. They just did it through the market and made others pay for it. So good on all of them. Everything happened perfectly. Headwater, we would say, built their business at the time with $45 oil looking out to 60 maybe. Well, they're, they're getting an average of 90 So I would argue that they're making more cash than they know what to do with. And they may not be in that paying, spending more than they usually do for very much longer. Do you worry that the market doesn't understand that and those growth companies are just not going to get rewarded from the average investor? They won't unless they distribute. Yeah, exactly. There's exactly. No That's right. Because what are you going to do? Just build more cash? Then they'll say, well, what are you going to do with that cash? How, if you're spending it on something, that's a risk to me. If you're giving it back to me, it's not a risk. I'll pay you more value for that share if you're telling me you're paying back that money. That's the environment we're in today. I've always kind of said it. I've said there's, I mean, if I've learned one thing from this business, it's like in our business, it's there's good business decisions 
and there's what the market wants. They're not always the same thing. And what's more important, a good management team who is in the public market that is exposed to it is aware that sometimes in spite of your good business decision, you might do something that the market wants, even if it's not what you want to do. And a lot of these producers early on in this cycle didn't like the idea that the market was dictating that they should pull it all back. And there were governments and markets that forced their hand. And now we're in this situation and the industry has completely changed into this broken bank machine. And they like it. And they're like, this is what you asked for. And now, you know, this is what you get. And you want us to produce more? And then you'd say that on one side of your mouth and on the other side, you say you're going to tax me? Well, we're not going to do anything. And that's what's happening. And to my point earlier, you cannot just turn it around on a dime and start spending again. You've got to, if you want a company to invest, you don't tax them, you incent them. That's like in my first year economics, yeah. right? So what would you do in your opinion? Rewarding shareholders and dividends and buybacks? Is it massive reserve life buildups or does it just depend or what, what, what would you favor? I would gravitate still to the best value quality companies within the subsectors you want to achieve in energy, which is predominantly oil, gas producers, the best producers, best reserve lives. All of the best companies are still way, way undervalued. So you don't have to go down to the higher risk, lower small caps. Stick with roughly, with a few exceptions, 100,000 barrels or greater is all you really need to stay in. And then I would say Canadian oil and gas in the medium term is going to, its value is going to elevate dramatically at a global scale because of our geopolitical risk globally. As I mentioned, the developed world is 30 million barrels producing f producing 30, using 45. The developing world is going to use that as a weapon of war against us. And if anybody doesn't believe me, well, it already happened. Would Putin have invaded Ukraine if he didn't have that? No way. No way. That is a clear example that it's already on us. Get used to it. That's the world we live in today. For the general investor, again, he would say, or her would say, that's great. I understand Canada's great, ethically fine and all that, but I want my cash now and I can't wait for the world to realize that Canada is a great place for anyone to invest in. What would your response be to that? Three years ago, I would have said, well, they're going to change. You got to wait it out. Today, we're saying the businesses, it's, I mean, I've used this analogy a few times and it was kind of a one I made up kind of silly, but I can't, I can't define this any differently. The industry is kind of like you, you, you walk by a bank machine and it's broken and it's, it's broken and it's spitting hundred dollar bills out. There aren't enough people to pick up the hundreds. So they're gathering on the floor now. So I don't know if she can't wait, then she's not looking down because it's on the floor below her feet literally just showering them with money. The vast majority of these very good businesses that I'm talking about that we would invest in are still not telling us what they're going to do with all their cash this year they're generating, mm -hmm. let alone what they're going to do with it next year. Yeah, so what would you do? I'm telling you, that's, that's why I'm suddenly, my risk is that how good a cash managers are these people? Because I got to watch now. It's like a problem. <laughs> it is. The problem is they don't know how to spend money, cash. They know how to procure assets and capital programs and 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 risk and <clears throat> years out programs. This is different. This is financial management. And it's, you know, watch the likes of uh, Mike Rose and what he did with Topaz when he was strapped, needed money, realized the value of a yield play and developed that company. That's a guy who with his track record and how he does it, you go, oh, he's a cash manager too. I want to be around that guy, right? I, I'm not, I mean, Murray Edwards, give me a break. I'm not going to ever question a stunt he pulls. He's, it's brilliant, these guys. They, it makes them. And, and, and it trickles into a lot of other guys in the business, you know, that do this. And 
And so we've got a bunch of good, prudent managers running their businesses here. They, they recognize what we've become. They're restricted by their ability to go back to the other route through s- services and the market's repelling them from it. And on top of that, they're going, this is the most profitable I've ever been in the lowest risk environment I'm taking doing it. Mm-hmm. Why would I leave wind to find wind here? Yeah, That's ridiculous. Do you worry that you're an expert and you understand all this, you know, all these very successful business leaders and all that, that you know this, but that Calgary is kind of a small ecosystem and that people outside of Calgary don't know this and that they won't realize this or, or is it, will the numbers speak for themselves? Well, I would say that the risk that they don't realize it will be mitigated by greed. <laughs> well, even the one now, because... As rates rise, Brookfield Renewable is spitting out 95% of its cash flow in dividends. So it's all of its cash flow goes to a dividend. And then they're spending a bunch of their money to grow an asset in a business that's very risky today, right? In an area that's not being valued. It needs incentives even to justify its value. And so there's a time and a place that you should be investing in these alternatives and energy technology. And the investor shouldn't be using their heartstrings to dictate where that capital should be deployed. And certainly a fiduciary like myself shouldn't be doing that. I've never went to school and studied the value of a return that someone would get out of the goodness of their heart. That That's just incalculatable. Everybody's going to be different. So we've made a huge mistake, and I think a lot of the banks realize it, and they're backstepping on this greenwashing and all the, the you know, these companies, these companies are down seventy percent, and billions of dollars, several hundreds of billions went into these businesses, and it's just been vaporized. the The answer to us is it's a balance, and we take the obligation as an energy manager to balance that for you. 14% of our assets are um, in this, what we call alternative energy, energy technology, and the rest is in the conventional energy sector. That should be your waiting today. There will be a time to invest in that sector. And we've got these investments that we incubate for the next cycle. But you should not be thinking it's one or the other. You should look at energy as all of it together. Canada, it should be thinking about it that way as well. And, and embracing it all. And that's what I said earlier, where an important factor will come when we really, a very important transition to the market understanding the value of this sector and actually trading it higher is when we realize that hydrocarbons are something we're going to have to live with. And that's a big turning point, I think, that we, we, we believe will shift the dynamic and ultimately the valuation of the sector. And you should be invested in it in preparation for that. If you're giving advice to the average investor out there looking to take advantage of this, you touched on it a little bit, but what would you, what advice would you leave them with? I would say not every energy investment you make is just energy as a whole. Think of it, we think of it as nine subsectors. So we would say today, stick to your oil producers, your, be very focused on your oil sands producers, stick to your gas producers, Make high grade your names. You don't have to go chase lower, smaller, riskier names today. The value, don't be caught up in what's happened since March of 2020. Yes, these things up are some of them five, six, seven, eight hundred percent, but they were trading off of a value that was unprecedented. They were trading at zero value. Now all the ships have risen. We're starting a clean slate. Stick with the best value names because of not the upside. It's that in this volatile market, your downside is way more limited in that group. So on a risk reward basis, high grade your market cap and stick to the the best names. There's still the best value out there and you can do it. And, And the concept is not about the returns, the opportunity. We talked about all the opportunity today. The opportunity in those names is their downside is way less volatile than those lower cap market cap smaller names and it's not too late this is 
You take COVID out of it, this group still trades at the lowest level it's ever traded at, ever. We're trading at 4.5% of the S&P in the US, and the earnings in the last quarter was 7%. So the earnings were greater than their representation. That's never happened. Now the expectation at Goldman is for the forward months, 10% of the earnings of the S&P, and they're only at 45 That implies a double in the group. And you know that the market will slingshot it further than that. So hang on to your hat. I think it looks really good. I think that's a great place to leave it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the time to just yap. <laughs> your time is valuable, so thank you. All right, cheers. <laughs> Anytime. I'll get a ski in one of these days. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode. If you liked what you heard, check out rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming shows. Until next time, happy coffee drinking. <laughs>